want to express my appreciation for providing me the opportunity to be a part of this lectureship. Uh, my thanks to the brethren for the work in putting it together, to all the preachers for the time and effort they put into the lessons that they brought. My thanks to Bobby for the work he does here and for the fact that given he's known me a lot of years, he was very kind and didn't tell any stories. So that worked out pretty good that way, I think. God versus the world. Satan, the prince of this world, has been extremely successful in leading people down the pathway of sin away from God. And it seems like in our society that it keeps going more and more all the time, that direction. Further and further away from the Lord and from the will of the Lord. There are a lot of things changing in our society round about us. Attitudes toward a lot of things, and certainly attitudes toward things such as homosexuality. They are attempting to a great degree to literally force it upon us and upon our society. They want it recognized as something that's legitimate, acceptable, an alternative lifestyle that, in their view, is deserving seemingly of equal standing to marriage, home, and family. But the ultimate authority on whether something is right or wrong, or whether it's good, is not my opinion, your opinion, or even popular opinion. The ultimate authority is always God in what He has to say about any given matter. God has spoken. Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God who in sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. God down through the ages has made His will known through the inspired prophets and writers. Likewise, in this last age, the Christian age or Christian dispensation, He has sought to clearly reveal His will to us through His beloved Son, whom He sent into this world to die for our sins at Calvary. God is seeking to make known to us what His will is for the lives of people. The psalmist declared in the 119th Psalm, verse 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. When God speaks, the matter is settled. We may discuss it, People may well hold different opinions, but it will not change what God has said or spoken. His Word is true from the very beginning. His judgments, once God has passed judgment on regard to something or a certain behavior, that judgment is going to stand. It will always stand. And it will not change regardless of how much people want it to change. The Word of God is the truth. John 17:17 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word thy word is true it is the truth on any matter it is the truth on this matter of homosexuality and for us or for our society as a whole to ignore what god has said and to do as we please we ultimately do so at our own peril and ultimately to our own destruction Solomon declared in Proverbs 14 and 34 that righteousness exalts the nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. The psalmist in Psalms 9 and 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. We cannot ignore God in what He says on any subject and expect for it to be well for us in regard to the next life, in regard to judgment and eternity. What has God said in the matter of homosexuality? What is God's attitude toward this so-called alternative lifestyle that seems increasingly to be forced upon us? In Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, verses 49 and 50, Ezekiel said, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her. And in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. 
Ezekiel lists several sins in regard to Sodom. But at the last there in that 50th verse, he says, they committed abomination before me. And he said, I took them away as a result. What was the abomination that caused God ultimately to take them away? If we go back to the 18th chapter and the 19th chapters of the book of Genesis, remember you have the men or the angels coming to Lot there, not to Lot, to Abraham, speaking to Abraham and talking with him about certain matters. And then remember two of them continue on their journey toward the city of Sodom. And we're told there in the 18th chapter of Genesis that God told Abraham in verse 21, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which has come up unto me. And if not, I will know. He said their cry came up to him that their sin was very grievous in the preceding verse. Those men were sent down to see they came to the city of Sodom in chapter 19. Lot extended to them hospitality. Provided for them, took them into his home. And then we're told in about verse 4 that before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, can pass the house round, both old and young, till the people, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. For a world that's not familiar with the terminology that the Bible uses many times, the idea of bring them out unto us that we may know them may sound kind of innocent. Almost like you'd want someone to come out that you might visit with them and get acquainted with them. But that same terminology, translated from the same words, is found also in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, where we're told that Adam knew his wife Eve, and as a result of that, she conceived and bare a son, Cain. That terminology, know them, is for the idea of having sexual relations with them or sexual intercourse. That was the sin, the abomination of the city of Sodom. And as a result, like the writer said, God took them away. Peter wrote later, years later, in Second Peter, the second chapter and verse 6, and he talked about how God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, as an example unto all that after should live ungodly. As an example. God made it abundantly clear how he viewed such behavior as went on in the city of Sodom. The kind of behavior that many in our society want to make legitimate and make acceptable. Moses gave the children of Israel God's law at Mount Sinai. That law covered so many areas and parts of their life. It addressed the subject of homosexuality. Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. They were not to lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. He didn't say just simply it is a sin. He said it is an abomination. Why does he use the term abomination? What does the term abomination mean? Vine in his dictionary defining such terms and words declares that it signifies an object of divine abhorrence. Something that God literally abhorred. Something he found very disgusting. The law of Moses went even further in giving us an indication of how God looked upon or viewed such behavior. On over in Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 13, If man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God's penalty for such behavior 
among His people was death. Not every sin carried the penalty of death immediately in the sense that they were to execute it. Yes, the end result of sin is that we die spiritually. It separates us from God. But in the sense that they were to carry out a sentence against the sin, not every sin had an immediate sentence that they were to carry out. But for such is homosexuality. The penalty that God assessed in this life was death. They were to destroy such people from among the people of God. In Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, verse 17 and 18, "...there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are an abomination unto the Lord thy God." Such was not to be found among the people of God. Such was an abomination in the sight of God. And yet in spite of such instructions as that, during the time or the period of Judges in Judges chapters 19 and 20, some individuals among or from the tribe of Benjamin out of a particular city, one city in particular, became involved in that kind of conduct that kind of behavior. 25,000 men of Benjamin died as a result. The tribe was to a great extent almost annihilated because of such conduct or behavior. In 1 Kings, the 14th chapter, verses 21 to 24, after Solomon's death, remember, the kingdom became divided. The ten northern tribes following Jeroboam, Judah and Benjamin remaining with Rehoboam. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. And they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And they were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Both Israel and Judah increasingly departed from God. Both Israel and Judah turned more and more to the practices, the idolatry, and what was a part of the religious idolatry of the people and nations round about them. Their religion sometimes even involves such practices as homosexuality and prostitution as a part of their religion. And little by little, some of Judah became involved in such idolatry and such practices. There were sodomites among the people of God. It was for such things that ultimately both Israel and Judah were carried away as they departed or turned away from God. It is interesting that as men forsake God, as they turn away from Him and reject Him, that they tend to become more perverted and more depraved all the time. Some would contend all those are Old Testament passages and that the Old Testament really doesn't have a bearing upon us today. We do not live under the Old Testament law or system. We live instead, yes, under the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul said, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. They give us a very good indication of how God viewed such things and such practices as homosexuality. What His attitude toward such was. But the New Testament likewise is not silent in regard to such matters. The Apostle Paul in the first chapter of the book of Romans talking about the Roman Gentile world of his day. Society that in many ways, particularly if you listen to the last part of that first chapter, doesn't sound like it's a whole lot different from the society that we live in today. They were involved in such as homosexuality. In fact, it may have been quite common among them. I don't know how much of that was going on in society in that day, but it was. 
And the Apostle Paul talked about him. About how in Romans 1, starting at verse 25, that they worshipped and served the preacher more than the Creator. He said, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which was me. Now he goes on to list a lot of other things that were common in society in that day, just like they are today. But you go down to verse 32. He said, "...who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them." Worthy of death, the inspired writer said, in regard to those that would lead those kind of lives and continue in that kind of lifestyle. Such naturally follows as men turn from God. So much of the Roman Gentile world of Paul's day really rejected God. In that same chapter, you can go back to verses 21 and 22, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. But became vain in their imagination, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Oh, they thought they knew everything. They had no need of God. They rejected God. They forgot God. They didn't care how God felt or thought about things. They'd do as they pleased. Kind of sounds familiar to our world, doesn't it? And yet God's attitude towards such did not change. It was still sin. He still looked at it and viewed it the same way. It will still be the same in regard to our society in the present day and time. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter, verse 9 and 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul again lists several things that many of those Christians previously apparently had been involved in. But remember, they'd been washed, they'd been sanctified, they'd been justified. They had turned to Christ and in obedience to the Gospel and being baptized into Him, they had been cleansed and made free from such sin and iniquity. But Paul in that list there speaks of effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. Those terms having an application to homosexuality and sodomy. He said those that do such things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If men choose that path and persist in that course, they cannot come into or be a part of the kingdom of God. In 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, we likewise again find a similar list there by the Apostle Paul listing several sins. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for foremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars or perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. What's doctrine? Remember, doctrine is teaching, isn't it? Isn't sound doctrine or sound teaching? Doesn't that come from the Word of God? Those things were contrary to the sound teaching or doctrine of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And men ought not to be involved or practice things that are contrary to the sound teaching of the Word of God. We should live instead by that Word of God and in obedience to it. In Jude, verse 7, "...even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over into fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire." Jude said, 
as he pointed back to Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them and the plain and what they became involved in and what they did, that they were set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God is really quite clear on His attitude and how He feels and views such things as the practice of homosexuality. But some still, while admitting that the New Testament does seem to condemn such practices, will still insist that, well, Jesus never personally addressed the subject by name or by term. And will seek to perhaps excuse such behavior as a result. In Luke chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus told His disciples, He that heareth you, heareth Me. He that despiseth you, despiseth Me. He that despiseth Me, despiseth him that sent Me. Those disciples would be sent out later under the authority of the Great Commission to go unto all the world and preach the Gospel. They would have had received the promise and the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit to guide them or to direct them unto all truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. That promise would be fulfilled there in the beginning of Acts, the second chapter, as they began filled with the Spirit to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in regard to His apostles, to hear you is to hear Me. To despise them, to reject them, and to reject and despise what they preached and taught under the authority of Jesus Christ inspired by the Spirit of God was to despise Jesus. And that was in turn to despise the Father in heaven that sent Him into this world. Paul addressed many problems in the church at Corinth in the Corinthian letter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, it appears that there may have been some that sort of questioned the authority of the Apostle Paul. What right did he have to say or teach the things that he taught? He stated that if any man were a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord, he said. They were not just Paul's opinions. Just like what is said elsewhere throughout the New Testament is not the opinion of the particular writer or speaker. They are the commandments of God given by the inspiration of God. And they are binding upon the lives of people as long as life continues in this world. And we will be accountable to them. Society may not like what they say. Society may want to change what they say. But we cannot change what God has said or God has spoken. As for Jesus personally addressing the matter, in the 19th chapter of Matthew, remember Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees about marriage, about the putting away of their wives. Jesus went on to tell them that because of the hardness of their heart, Moses suffered them to write them a bill of divorcement and put them away, but it was not so from the beginning. That was not God's plan or design. He said in verse 9 that whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. Fornication, remember, is the broader term. It's more broader than the term adultery. It is a term that in many instances, most instances, applies to all unlawful sexual intercourse. Why did Jude say Sodom and Gomorrah were set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire? Because they gave themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. In a way, in Jesus' condemnation of fornication, though He was speaking in that context in Matthew chapter 19 in regard to the question asked Him about whether or not a man could put away his wife for every cause, doesn't He also condemn such practices as, forni as homosexuality under the term fornication? I think indeed Jesus does address the subject. 
Man may not want to see it that way, but I think it is certainly covered under the terminology that Jesus uses there. And most generally, always in regard to the Word of God, God's terminology in regard to matters is usually pretty precise. He is always specific in regard to the terminology that He uses. He knows exactly what He means for it to cover. Homosexuality is a perversion. It's a perversion of what God's original design and intention was. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 give us the creation of this world and all that's a part of the natural world round about us, including the creation of man and his being placed in the Garden of Eden. What's the first thing that God says about man? If memory serves me right in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, his first statement is that it's not good for man to be alone. And so God decided to make man a helpmeet. A helpmeet that was suited or that was fitted for him. And as a result, He caused the deep sleep to come upon Adam. He took a rib out of his side and He created woman and He brought her, remember, unto the man. They were joined together. They became one flesh. God instituted marriage, family, and the home. That was God's original intention and divine plan. Now, God could have made another man. He certainly had the power and the capability to have done so. But He did not. He did not create another man as a helpmeet for Adam. He created woman. Jesus again back there in Matthew chapter 19 questions again about marriage. Remember, Jesus takes His stand on what God ordained or set in order in the beginning. Back there in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Jesus said God made them male and female. And went on and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God's original plan, what God ordained for marriage, family, and the home, was one man joined to one woman till they were parted by death. Homosexuality is very much a perversion of what God originally designed or ordained. It is no wonder that God considered it an abomination and that God's attitude towards such is so plainly set forth within the Word of God. Many attempts are made to tell us that it's something people can't help. That it is not a choice, but it's something that people have no control over that it's genetic. They've searched and searched for something that they could use to say that it's in the genes. It's determined by the genes. People can't help themselves. You know, that's really not new. Hasn't it always been the case that man has always sought one way or the other to excuse his sin or iniquity and to justify it somehow? He's done that since clear back there in the beginning at the Garden of Eden when Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent. And really indirectly, Adam more or less blamed God for giving him that woman. Man doesn't want to take responsibility for the choices and decisions that he makes. Homosexuality is a learned behavior. It is a choice. It is not something that God has programmed into man. Solomon said, Lo, this only have I found that God made man upright but they have sought out many inventions in Ecclesiastes 7 and 29. God made man upright. James tells us in James 1, 13 to 15, Let no man say, When I am tempted, I am tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Lust, when hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. How did James say it worked? 
James knew that man had certain desires and passions that were God-given. But he also understood that God ordained a proper role and a proper realm for the exercise of such passions and emotions. Man is often enticed to do otherwise. He often gives in to that enticement. Lust when it hath conceived bringeth forth sin, sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Man chooses to exercise those passions and desires in a way or manner that is contrary to the will of God. That is sin. It's a choice. The Apostle Paul knew it was a choice. Those in Corinth knew it was a choice. Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9-11, to As Paul talked about the things that those Christians had previously been involved in, some of them had apparently been involved in the practice of homosexuality or involved in homosexual relationships. Yet Paul said, such were some of you. If it was genetic and something they had no control over, would it have been possible or had no control over, would it have been possible for them to change? Paul said they were such. They had changed. They had repented. They had turned from such. They'd been washed, justified, and sanctified by their obedience to the Gospel and by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were no longer living that way of life. They were no longer practicing or doing such things. Man can exercise his free will and make the proper choices and decisions. It is up to man to do so. It's a choice. Not something that men have no control of. What shall we do? We should not be as the Pharisees. The Pharisees were extremely good at seeing all the sin and iniquity in the lives of other people in their day and unable so many times to see their own. Jesus, upon more than one occasion, rebuked them for that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all sin. But the Bible also tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world God hates sin, but He loves the sin. We should do likewise. He sent His Son into this world to die not just for my sin and your sin, whatever it may have been or whatever it is, but for the sins of all mankind, including those that are involved in such practices as homosexuality. We see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 I like that verse in particular because it makes Jesus' sacrifice personal for every man, every individual, each and every one of us. And as surely as God's grace is extended to one in adultery, or one that's guilty of lying, or one that's guilty of stealing, His grace is extended to those that are involved in the practice of homosexuality. But just as men have to turn from any sin, they likewise have to turn from the practice of homosexuality. Our responsibility is, as the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, verses 26 and 7, to declare the whole counsel of God that men might come to know and understand that according to God and by God's law, that such things as homosexuality are sin. But that they also might come to understand that God hath provided a way and a means, a remedy, by which men might be made free from sin and be reconciled to God. That not only can men change, but that men are commanded to change. Paul said in Acts 17.30, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because He hath appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, where He hath given assurance unto all men, and that He hath raised Him from the dead. 
whatever sin or iniquity, men must repent. They must turn from such and forsake such. The homosexual must turn from such and forsake that way of life. The apostles preached the Gospel at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Those people, many in that multitude, were guilty probably of many things. Some were guilty of very grievous sin, or what we'd call very grievous. They'd helped kill and crucify the Son of God. They'd probably been in the multitude that cried out, Crucify Him, crucify Him. And yet as they came to believe in Jesus Christ as the Redeemer, the Savior, the Son of God, they ask in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in verse 38. That is still the solution to the matter of sin. Whether it be adultery, whether it be murder, whether it be lying, whether it be the practice of homosexuality, it's still the only way men can be made free from sin and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We must hold that up to the world around us. We must try to persuade people to take advantage of that opportunity. Remember those brethren at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, some of which who had been involved in such practices had taken advantage of that opportunity and were no longer living the homosexual lifestyle. Our society certainly seems to want to embrace it. More and more people, it seems, are accepting it. The views of our society may indeed change a lot. Malachi said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. In Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter what our society does and no matter what people think, no matter what their attitudes become toward any sin, including homosexuality, God's attitude is not going to alter or change in the least. It's going to stay exactly the same. And likewise, His Word is not going to change. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but My Word shall not pass away. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. God still views it today like He's always viewed it. He'll continue to view it the same way all the way to judgment and eternity, no matter how much of our society embraces this perversion. May we stand up and earnestly contend for the faith as Jude talked about in Jude verse 3. May God give us the courage to in love, in meekness, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11, and to hold up to a world lost in sin the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and that there is hope for even people involved in the practice of homosexuality. If they will repent and come in obedience to the Gospel of Christ, and serve Him and do His will rather than continue down that perverted lifestyle. Thank you for your attention this evening. You've been very good, very attentive. And thanks again to the brethren for this lectureship and for the opportunity to be a part of it.